Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. The goal of this talk is to understand the butterfly effect in quantum systems. The butterfly effect is a basic stand-in for chaos. You all know what it is. As you can see, a butterfly flaps its wings in Beijing, and halfway around the world, you get a tornado in Kansas. Despite the obvious scale difficulties with this cartoon, um, it does correctly capture at least some of the way we want to think about the butterfly effect. Um, a small perturbation or change, in this case, the absence or presence of the eponymous butterfly, um, uh, leads to an exponentially large effect on the system sometime later, the tornado. In quantum systems, the question becomes, can a small perturbation W have a macroscopic effect on the system? And does this occur for any such small perturbation W, or does the nature of the perturbation matter? And how would we measure this? Said another way, we're interested in understanding the time evolution of simple local operators. Here, W is my simple local operator, and W of t is uh, often called a precursor of W. In general, W of t will not be simple and local. It'll be non-local sum of products of local operators. And the main thing that I hope to convey is that it's the growth of this operator, W of t, um, is what I mean by the butterfly effect, and I hope to make that precise. There's been a lot of recent interest in studying the butterfly effect in quantum systems, and um, one not-so-recent interest. Um, and uh, I also want to highlight uh, parallel investigation in terms of uh, studying the relationship between black holes and chaos, um, started by Steve Shanker, Douglas Stanford. Unfortunately, that's outside the scope of this talk, but I do encourage you to attend Douglas's talk tomorrow, um, which um, I think he'll also talk about a bound on chaos with work with Juan Maldacena and Steve Shanker. Um, I'll only be talking about um, these two um, these two papers, which are a collaboration with Lenny Suskin and Douglas Stanford, and one just with Douglas. Okay. So the plan is to understand the butterfly effect, first in a simple qubit system, or spin chain, and then in one plus one dimensional conformal field theory. The spin chain example is useful because it's a uh, um, a particular example of a concrete system. It's about as concrete as you can get. Um, and then we can sort of attack it directly and then use, those, um, use what we learned from those results to go um, and study conformal field theory. So um, this is the spin chain system I have in mind. Um, my notation is that I'll be using capital X, Y, and Z to stand for the sigma X, Y, and Z poly matrices. Um, and the subscript indicates the site on which these matrices are are acting, these operators are acting. Um, my Hamiltonian has an Isaac-like, Ising-like nearest neighbor term. Um, it has a transverse field, and it has a uh, parallel field. And everything I say should be taken um, to be statements about generic um, Hamiltonian time evolution. Um, when, I have to, when I use um, numerics, I'll of course have to pick um, values for these parameters, but what's really important is just that the parameters are outside um, the region of integrability, um, but otherwise what I'm saying should hold pretty generally. And the length of the spin chain just needs to be large, uh, pretty much greater than two to see these effects. Um, okay, so this is the sort of operator and time evolution that we're interested in studying. Um, we'll take the, spoli the, uh, the spin poly Z operator, put it on the first site, and then study its time evolution. Well, we can just expand this um, using the baker campbell hausdorff formula. And what we see is that this expansion is a sum of terms that involve um, time-dependent coefficients, of course, and nested commutators with the Hamiltonian. Um, the kth term in this expansion goes like t to the k over k factorial, and uh, you, you get um, k nested commutators. In this simple example, um, What's nice is that we can just attack this directly and to get some intuition for, for, how this, um, for what's happening in this expansion. So let's uh, consider these nested commutators. I start with Z1, I commute it with H, um, it commutes with every term except for uh, that term, and, um, and it flip, the action of this is to flip it and make it a Y. Um, note in this, in this brief section, I'm going to be suppressing the time dependence and um, and, and G basically setting G and H equal to one. And I'm really interested in studying um, the evolution of, of these poly strings. Well, what do I mean by these strings? Um, well, let's take another one of these nested commutators. And we see that Y doesn't commute with any of the terms in the Hamiltonian. So we get two strings of length one, 
and one string of length 2. And what we're going to find um, is that um, this commuting with h lets these strings um, both proliferate and grow long. The general mechanism is that uh, um, we start with a z. It doesn't commute with the gx term in the Hamiltonian, and that flips it to a y. And then that doesn't commute with the uh, nearest neighbor Ising term, and then that grows it one longer. And then the other terms serve to sort of scramble all these, um, all these strings around. So what we see is that late terms in this expansion um, are just a huge mess, a, a collection of these uh, poly strings of, of different lengths, um, really dominated by longer lengths for longer as, as you go longer down the chain. And they involve non, you know, sums of, these are sums of products of different operators acting on each site um, and basically involve all the possible operators in, in the system. Um, what we're really interested in studying, um, so, so this tells us that as terms later in the expansion become more important, um, our operator starts to look disorganized like this. Um, in order to actually understand the time evolution, um, we should uh, restore the time dependence. So one natural thing we can do is we can group the strings by their length. So here's an example where I have uh, strings, um, I've isolated the strings of length two, um, and they have time dependence alpha, beta, gamma. I square them, sum them, and this p of two gives me um, the time dependent um, weight of finding a string of length two within this, uh, within this operator. Um, the reason I square them is that uh, for uh, this summing this over all such string lengths is a nice quantity that's conserved under time evolution. So I can do this for all different string lengths. And what we see is, um, well, and, and using um, exact, diag exact diag diagonal, uh, using numerical techniques, <laughs> um, we start, um, of course, at t equals 0. It's length 1. And then slowly, um, as we saw, um, given our intuition from this, these nested commutators, um, we have one of length. It, we, as we evolve in time, we, we see that it exchanges dominance with strings of length 2, 3, and so forth. Oh, I should mention this. Uh, this example has a spin chain of length 8. So we see that eventually um, it's dominated by strings that are of length the entire system. And if I could fit it on this slide, um, these strings would uh, be involve all different combinations of, of the x, y's, and z's. Good. So now that we understand that there's this nice picture of this operator of these strings proliferating and growing, um, what we really want is a measure of size of this precursor. So the natural thing to do is to take the average string length. We take this weight of strings of length k, we multiply it by k and sum it over all such k, and we get this, you know, the normal. Um, average. However, this average is highly dependent on this decomposition into this polystring basis um, and um, segregation into strings of different lengths. And as a result, it won't generalize to other settings, for instance, in conformal field theory that we want to study later. What we really want is some way of measuring the length or the size of our precursor. And so consider this commutator. I take my precursor, z1 of t, and then I take a second simple local operator, in this case I've chosen z at site j, and I take their commutator, I square it um, in order to avoid phase cancellations, I take the minus sign to make sure it's positive, um, and then I average it over the thermal ensemble, which is the state that I'll be interested in for the rest of the talk. This object um, is a measure of the strength of the butterfly effect at site j. Let's um, consider this commutator first at fixed j and study its time dependence. So at, at some fixed j, um, we have zj over here, and at early times, z1 is over here, and there are poly operators acting on different sites, so they commute. Um, if this was a relativistic system, we might say they're space-like separated, um, which we will say, in fact, later, but for now, they're just clearly op acting on different sites, and they commute. As z1 of t grows and expands, we looked at its series expansion, and we know that it's growing these strings of longer and longer length. They're becoming more and more important. Um, and at some point, those strings are going to reach out to site J, and, no, and these operators will no longer commute. And that's what's going on um, here in the numerics. Um, we wait some time, and eventually the influence grows to reach site J, at which point this commutator grows to its late time value, which is 2. Alternatively, we can study this as a function of fixed time and very J. And this is exactly the sort of object that we were interested in. It's a measure of the size of Z1 of T. Uh, of our precursor. 
Um, we z1 of t at some fixed lar you know, large enough fixed t is some operator that has some, some radius or size. And what we do is we, we vary j around. We take the simple local operator, and we measure it at different points, and we find the place where it begins to start commuting. Um, in this case, it's around 8, and, and that's the size of our operator. And so I sort of spoiled my next slide. This gives us a really natural definition um, of size in terms of this commutator. We, take, um, we find the point where it begins to transition where it's equal to 1, and that j star, such that it's equal to 1, is the size. The reason I have 1 in quotes here um, is because when we uh, extend to other systems, um, the spin chain, uh, only, this is only equal to 1. The midpoint is only equal to 1 for these spin chain variables. And for, for other systems, we'll need to normalize it for this to be the case. Good. So now that we have two notions of size, um, we can ask the question of how fast do these things actually grow under chaotic time evolution? And this is the answer. It's ballistic or linear. Um, here, I have plotted both notions of size. Um, the commutator definition, the way I've defined it, um, only takes integer values um, for, this, for the discrete spin chain system. But we see they basically um, agree entirely. And we get this nice linear growth until the operator grows to be the size of the system, which is 8, at which point they, it saturates and stops. Um, I would also mention, um, so you might, linear um, for these spin chain systems is um, the maximum speed it could grow um, due to this Lee Robinson bound, um, which unfortunately, if you know what that is, great. Otherwise, I don't have time to go into it now, but um, it saturates. It's, this is as fast as you can imagine these operators growing. So now that we understand that uh, operators grow, local operators grow linearly under chaotic time evolution, we can address the question of the butterfly effect. That is, how does the insertion of an operator at one point, uh, a local operator at one place, affect distant degrees of freedom? And the way we're going to do that is with this commutator um, that I mentioned before. Let me reiterate, this commutator is telling me um, the effects of perturbations of W on later measurements of V, and vice versa. And my claim is that for all simple Hermitian operators, uh, W and V, having order one energy, um, order one is important because these should be simple, uh, these should be uh, small perturbations, so not have energy large compared to the system size. Localized at x and y respectively, um, this commutator should grow. At early times, they're apart. They're, for relativistic system now, they're, let's talk about their space like separated. This will commute. Um, and then eventually we have this nice picture now of, of W expanding and growing outward. Eventually it'll reach V, at which point they'll cease to commute. Um, and that's a measure of the strength of the butterfly effect. So we can expand this in terms of correlation functions, which is a useful thing to do, um, for instance, um, for conformal field theory, which is where we're going to go next. Um, and what we see is um, there are two different types of terms here. On the top, we have, a term, we have terms that are like a norm of a perturbed thermal state. In this state, let's focus on the one on the left here. I, it's a thermal state. I apply the operator V. It's a small perturbation. Um, I evolve in time. The it's a thermal system, so the system thermalizes, returns to equilibrium. And then I apply the perturbation W, and I'm just taking essentially the norm of the state. And this, this should, um, that should be basically the two-point function of the W uh, of W times the norm of the perturbation that I applied, which is the two-point function of V. So this should approach the product of the two-point functions at late time, which is what I mean by one. In fact, um, if I had space, I would divide by these quantities, and then it will equal one exactly. These terms are different. These terms are like an uh, inner product of two different states. On this one, I apply w, and then I apply v. And that's an inner product with one where I apply v, and then I apply w. And as a result, um, as a result, we don't expect them to approach an order one late time value. If, if we think that, um, so let's, let's think about what should happen. At early times, everything is space-like separated, so we can, we're at liberty to move the operators around in the, in the correlation functions, and so um, these things should, everything should just cancel. At late times, um, this W operator is growing out, and eventually it'll reach V. And if this commutator, as I've argued, should increase, and these red terms should stay order one, then we need these blue terms to decay. And in fact, the claim is that they're going to decay exponentially. There's a delay related to this growing of the W operator. And then eventually, when it reaches to V, um, it should decay exponentially in time. And so um, 
what we learn um, is that um, the effect of chaos is to decorrelate. We wait some time for, this oper for these operators to, for this perturbation to grow and reach V, at which point um, it, this correlation function decays. My claim is that this is the basic diagnostic of quantum chaos. In order to evaluate this, let's now turn to uh, one plus one dimensional conformal field theory. So my goal is to compute um, the four point functions um, for two different model one plus one dimensional systems. First, a large central charge CFT with a sparse low lying spectrum. And second, the 2D Ising model. And here, um, for convenience, I've left, and I will do for the rest of the time, um, I've left um, these blue cor these uh, inner product of two different state correlation functions. I'll leave them blue, and I'll leave the norm of a perturbed thermal state correlation function red. Um, I know the font is hard to read in the back, so hopefully this will be clear. Um, and also, I've properly normalized them by the two-point functions. And oh, sorry. And I should add that in in the spin chain systems. Um, it was very easy to attack the problem directly, but here it's not clear. Um, we we want to find out what what um, how chaos arises in these theories, or doesn't arise. What controls the chaotic behavior of the theory? So, in order to compute these uh, four-point functions, I want to consider a related quantity, which is the Euclidean four-point function on a plane. Um, the Euclidean function, the Euclidean four-point function, is defined when z um, when uh, the conformal cross ratios z and z bar are related by z bar is equal to the complex conjugate of z, or z star. Um, but And all Whiteman functions are analytic continuations of each other. And so what we'll do is we'll analytically continue this to independent z and z bar. And when we do that, holding z bar fixed, for instance, there's a branch cut in the complex z plane running from the insertion of the w operator, the v operator at 1 to the v operator at infinity. And so that'll be our strategy. Um, additionally, um, using a conformal transformation to map the cylinder to the plane, or vice versa, um, we can, I guess the other way, I should say, um, we can relate z to the Lorentzian coordinates of interest. And the main takeaway of this is just that the limit of z going small is the late time limit that we're actually interested in. OK, so now that I've argued that we can get our Lorentzian Four-point functions by analytic continuation, we should figure out which analytic continuations correspond to which, uh, which correlators. So the procedure is that we apply, um, it's a generalization of the I-epsilon prescription, we apply um, Euclidean time to each, uh, to each of the operators in the correlation function in an order corresponding to our Lorentzian order of interest. Then we increase in Lorentzian time to, late, to large Lorentzian times, and we follow the path of the cross ratio z in the complex plane. And what we see is for this blue um, inner product of two different states correlation function, um, the correlation, the cross ratio passes through this branch cut at one. Um, and so we should continue to the second sheet in order to compute it. For this norm of a perturbed thermal state, that doesn't happen, and we stay on the primary sheet. And what we learn, and the main takeaway from this section, is that chaotic behavior is determined by the second sheet of the planar of, of the four-point function on the plane. Good. So now let's consider specific examples. Uh, no, not yet. Um, first, uh, first, let's uh, understand this beha the behavior on the different sheets. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I know David Pullen covered uh, uh, conformal block expansion very clearly yesterday, so I'm going to breeze through this slide. Um, the main takeaway is that um, since we're interested in small z, we can expand in the channel where z and z bar are small. Um, and um, in order to gain and and so to, be, to gain to int some intuition for how this works, we can focus on the SL2 conformal block expansion, the global conformal block expansion, and focus on just one non-trivial term in the sum. So I include the identity and the universal contribution for the stress tensor. And taking z small, I find uh, that we get one. So on the primary sheet, as expected, this uh, red uh, norm of a, of a perturbed thermal state correlation function is equal to one. However, there's also a second sheet. Um, so um, following the uh, correlation, following, um, and the hypergeometric function has a branch cut running from one to infinity as expected. So following the contour around uh, z equals one and then taking z small, instead we find a huge effect. So the second term is becoming order one at a time t equal to the distance plus uh, this constant. 
So to actually determine the behavior, um, we need to consider we need to consider more terms in the expansion. This is this is out of control. Um, that sort of makes sense because I've put in no really no input other than the universal, uh, in, you know, the contribution of the stress sensor. Um, I put in no input um, as to what theory I'm considering. Um, and so um, we should imagine that this depends on, for instance, whether the theory is chaotic or not. So let's now, cons now let's consider some specific examples. So first I'll start with a large central charge, uh, one plus one dimensional CFT with a sparse low-lying spectrum. Um, in this case, we can use the Virasoro symmetry um, to regroup the terms in the sum um, and to be over Virasoro primaries. In this case, the identity block includes uh, the contribution of all pairs and derivatives of the stress tensor. And um, Fitzpatrick, Kaplan, and Walters computed this object for us. Um, so I've just reproduced their formula here. And for an appropriately sparse low-lying spectrum, um, this and only this approximates the full correlator. So we can take this and evaluate it on both sheets, and we find that this theory be is behaving chaotically. Um, first, on the primary sheet, um, we see that it's equal to one, as expected. And on the second sheet, um, what we see is that it's decaying exponentially in time, and uh, this occurs for any choice of our operators v and w. Um, I'll return to this in a second. I just want to also point out that we can use our definition of size from earlier in the talk, and this notion that v w of t should be growing linearly in time, and that's exactly what we see. Um, I'll also mention that there's, um, okay, good. Um, finally, I just want to point out that there's this delay related to the distance, and that's exactly what we expected. We make a perturbation here for w, and we let it grow outwards, and it has to, you have to wait a time related to the distance between w and v um, before the correlations can start to be affected and the correlator can start to decay. Finally, there's also a delay related t star, which is known as the fast scrambling time of Hayden, Pascal, Sakino, and Suskind. And um, um, I don't really have time to go into the details of that, um, but, that's, but that's what this t star delay is. Okay. Finally, um, for a sanity check, it's good to consider uh, well-known integrable systems and see that our criteria is not satisfied. So for the 2D Ising model, there's only three Virasoro primary operators. And in this case, we can compute the correlation function exactly. The conformal blocks are well known. Um, and so we can just evaluate for all the different combinations of these uh, primary operators in a four-point function. On the primary sheet, everything uh, goes to one, as expected. And on the second sheet, only this four sigma correlation function vanishes at large t which is consistent with the theory not being chaotic, which is great because it's integrable. Good. So returning to our beginning of our talk, um, can a small perturbation have a macroscopic effect on the system? And does this happen for um, any small perturbation, W? For systems that have chaotic time evolution, the answer is yes. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Questions? You, you talked about the diagnostic in thermal states. Yes. One would expect similar things to hold if you took reasonably uh, a, a theory with a, re with a sp dense enough spectrum at high enough energies. Uh -huh. So is there a microcanonical analog of this diagnostic that you would, you would expect to see? You're saying that if I instead considered an excited state, would I see this? Yeah. Yeah, I would expect that too. But in that case, for instance, in the, um, I'd have to compute a six-point function, and I don't know how to do that. I'm sorry, I can't. Can Could one imagine sta starting with a vacuum uh -huh. and using one of your operators to actually push you up the spectrum right. and, and then actually only compute a four-point function? Would that work? Um, oh, I see. You're saying, uh, starting the, you're saying make like W have large, uh, large energy and then consider um, the, por uh, the correlation function with, with V. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I have to. I have to think about that. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, 
So, uh, so you made this remark about uh, you know the two D Ising model being an integrable system yes. and therefore not showing no, uh, chaotic uh, behavior. Now, it's been known uh, for the last uh, a decade or so that uh, the uh, you know the transverse field Ising model, for example, uh, does have thermalization. Uh, so, you know this thermalization not to the standard Gibbs ensemble, but something called the generalized Gibbs ensemble, yeah. which mm -hmm. keeps track yes. of all these other uh, you know. Conserve charges, mm -hmm. so it's not immediately clear that you know mm, uh, there cannot be any uh, you know there is so much of a contrast between the large C two D CFT and uh, of course uh, thermalization does not necessarily mean that it has to follow from some chaotic behavior, uh -huh. but uh, th various things about integrable uh, models uh, you know were not known before. And now we know that uh, local operators do thermalize. OK, good. Well, it's, it's good you brought that up. So uh, I have a couple of points to make very quickly. Um, first, um, so you see that there is something here that's growing. Um, but in these, vari these, vi these are not, uh, the Ising model is known to be related to a system of free fermion, free fermion in which case the behavior is that um, you have this expanding shell. Um, but the operator is not actually growing. Like the picture I've made with these strings um, in the beginning, it's like forming a ball. And in this case, um, w in the variables where it's just a free fermion, it's just expanding like a shell. The other point I want to make is that, for instance, um, the transverse Ising model that you brought up with uh, h equals 0 and g equals 1, um, in these spin variables, um, you see very, very different behavior. Um, and basically, instead of having strings of all different um, of all different x y and z they're very ordered it's because it's a free fermion and um, it's not which is non locally related to these spin variables with the jordan wigner transform and so what you see is that um, sure in for certain choices of this operator not all of them which is what the conformal field theory analysis showed something is growing but it's basically this fact that there's this fermion moving down the chain that's sort of anchored at one side. So if you pick the wrong set of variables, it looks like it's growing, but um, then it bounces off the end of the chain and it starts shrinking immediately. Whereas for the chaotic system, it's just going to stay, uh, the size of this operator is going to stay um, of order the size of the system for you know, a doubly exponentially long time. Whereas um, the integrable one, it's just going to bounce back and forth. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi. So you just showed how you have some diagnostics for chaos, and you showed how thermal systems behave und under the di diagnostic. Uh -huh. What if I try to take a chaotic system and look at its correlators and connected correlators by which we usually look at thermalization? What will that look like? I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that. You want to take a chaotic system and look at its correlators? It's e yeah, so the correlators and connected correlators have particular beha behaviors on in when you thermalize, right? I'm looking at, I am, I am looking at its thermal correlators, or do you mean some, wh what do you? Oh, so the, the two, I see, uh, thank you. Um, so there is another thing that happens, which is that uh, two-point functions um, decay, thermal two-point functions decay, is that, is that what you're asking about? Um, in which case, that's related to, essentially, the chaotic part is related to uh, the four-point function controls the behavior around here, and then um, the decay, the exponential decay of the two-point function is sort of related to this oscillating behavior up here, and um, that's that's sort of a that that's that's sort of a quantity that's sensitive to uh, um, it's this four-point function that's sensitive to this idea of this perturbation having a macroscopic effect of the system, as opposed to some sort of local no notion of thermalization. It's time to uh, thank Dan Roberts.